let me begin with um, Horst. How has the success of machine learning changed the computing industry? Actually, substantially, very substantially. I think this is part of a bigger picture. So you heard already Alejandro talking about the end of Moore's law. There is a lot of innovation going into computing currently. But very specifically, in the last couple of years, uh, computing companies have been extremely successful because of a new demand coming out of machine learning and unfortunately also out of cryptocurrency mining. So companies such as NVIDIA have been selling their processors um, like hotcakes and at significantly increased prices. So if you look at the price structure of what's happening in the market is, is a lot of computers are almost twice as expensive today as they were compared to a year ago. Now, once you have, and that's no news to you, is once you have this um, market happening that there is an incredible demand driven by machine learning and cryptocurrency mining, um, and there is insufficient supply, yes, of course, short-term prices go up, but long-term, there is an incredible amount of investment going back in Silicon Valley into computer architecture and into building new machines. So over the last year, everybody observed those prices going up for computers. There were 45 new companies, so thereabouts, created just in the last year, year and a half, that all are trying to benefit from this increased uh, interest in machine learning. And that's completely unheard of, because in Silicon Valley for the last decade or more, no VC ever invested in a hardware company. They invested in apps and in software, mm -hmm. in things that had immediate payoff. Investing in something that may take uh, 50 to 100 million dollars until you get a product out was just unheard of. And so this was fundamentally going to change the computer market as well. Not all 45 companies will survive, but there may be two or three that will survive. They will have new products that will make machine learning even more accessible. So I think it's a very positive dynamic, and we've just seen the beginning of this change. So I think, uh, as my colleague Dave Patterson, who uh, is this year's Turing Award winner, said, we're re-entering a golden age of computer architecture. And I think that is exciting. It's driven by machine learning. Very good. Alejandro. What are the major challenges to overcome from the implementation of real-world applications in quantum computing? So I think uh, I, I would summarize in uh, there, there are a few a few items. So one of the ones uh, I mentioned during the presentation is uh, although we've been playing with uh, programming these devices, let's say for the last ten years, and coming up with algorithms, and the, the history of, of applications for of quantum computing. Most likely, you heard of even in the since the 1970s, 1980s, 1980s when actually everything kicked off. 1990s, like uh, with the short uh, algorithm for factoring for breaking um, a cryptography, or for example, like for searching and structured databases. That's another some of the applications that you might have heard of quantum computation. I think one of the big challenges, and that's actually what uh, keeps me awake awake at night is actually to find valuable applications, like the ones that you have at hand, where we can really prove that, we can, that these devices are going to show any advantage with hundreds to thousands uh, of qubits only. So that's, that's what I see is the near term for these devices. I'm finding these applications for us and demonstrating that you can, we can have an advantage that would be key for the success of these technologies. So certainly from the from the hardware side, and this is also motivated by the application because uh, as Horst was mentioning, the applications also drive the technology, is certainly the, the integration of the device itself, let's say the hardware architecture. Is it still, is it still a green field? So for the most part, what we see in the, the hardware companies, they have an idea of the, this, the building blocks, but in reality, if we had a clear application that was a killer application for quantum computation, they, they will certainly drive the hardware towards that. So the integration of the hardware itself with the application is important. And I mean, there are the typical things that you might have heard about the, the challenges, certainly uh, reducing the noise significantly. So these devices are very fragile. Um, Marcos mentioned the operation of, for example, of our device is of the order to 10 to 15 millikelvin. So that's of the order of 200 times colder than the deep space. So it's actually it's the coldest place in the universe. I mean, not even in nature we find this temperature. So operating these devices is very fragile. So they're very susceptible to noise. And those are one of the main challenges from the engineering side. We know from the science that they should work. It's just the engineering aspect is, is an important one. 
And the other one is the error correction. So we could actually, that's a more long-term goal for quantum computers to be robust and stable in the long term. Certainly error corrected devices is the way to go, but that's more like in the, in the 20 year time span. So those are, I would say, the main challenges that we face right now. Very good. David, <clears throat> what do you think are the implications of AI ML in fooling yourself with extreme data mining? Uh, uh, I think I touched on it, uh, you know, at, at the end of my talk, where um, I, I wrote a paper that is probably going to be quoted in my obituary in, in the 90s um, uh, called Stupid Data Miner Tricks, uh, Overfitting the S&P 500. And uh, we took a CD of completely non-financial data from the UN. It had statistics on 150 member countries, things like cattle and sheep populations, number of bathtubs and, and the like, and it, 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 on an annual time scale. And we tried to find the best single fit for the S&P 500 over a 10-year period. And it turned out we got a, a R squared of 0.75 with butter in Bangladesh. And then we said, okay, how much better can we do? You throw in cheese. And it, it, the, the nature of regression is that if you put in another variable that's not perfectly correlated with the first one, you're gonna do better. So we got to like 0.9. And we threw in sheep population. <laughs> and it, it takes you to 0.99. And it was, it was totally bogus, but it looked fabulous. Well, from butter to cheese to sheep population, <laughs> to sheep. I, I see a theme there developing. Yeah. <laughs> then we said, okay, how about, like, well, it's enough with this regression stuff. We used um, Maxima to do some infinite precision arithmetic, and we just used the year's digit. <laughs> and, and you can fit a polynomial that is perfect, that has a, the R squared of one. Uh, that way, I mean, your coefficients are very long to, to get it to be, to be so precise. And that's a relatively low-powered technology. Um, there's, a, there's a system called Eureka. I don't know if you, you guys have heard of it. It's, it's another, um, it fits a symbolic regression. Regression, you, you know, you sort of assume a functional form mm -hmm. you know, and then you, you estimate the, the parameters. Symbolic regression is where you allow the, the functional form to change. So you can, you can do rationals, you can, you can let it include anything you want. And this will, it, it started out when, when they first, it, it came out of the Cornell Creative Computation Lab, I believe it was, and that, uh, a company was, was spun off. And now you can, you can download the sample and, and it runs uh, on the Amazon uh, cloud, the, the Amazon Web Services, and you can see how many models it looks at. And, and the number quickly gets into the billions. And many of them are fabulous. And I've, I've done some things in finance, I've showed it to some friends in physics, and it comes up with some great stuff. In physics, there were some, pe some people working in plasma physics. One of the variables it found was density of the plasma to the power of density of the plasma to the power of density of the plasma to the power of density of the plasma, the fourth involute of density. This just doesn't show up in physics, right. but it's a great fit. And, you know, if you, you can torture the data till it screams, if, you know, if you uh, kiss enough frogs, you'll find one that looks like a prince. <laughs> uh, the, it, it's so easy. To, to, to fool yourself. Yeah. And, and the more computa you know, the, so the idea of statistical significance doesn't really mean anything anymore. You, right. know, the, you know, there are so many false positives. I hope that answers the question. Yep. Let me take one question from <coughs> Slido. Um, problem, the problem in finance uh, is usually not enough useful data instead of having too much data. Where are some research to overcome this? Um, let me give a try on this one. Um, well, it is true that, uh, you know, uh, until very recently, the only kind of data that was available for financial research was uh, prices, volume, then ar the ticks ar arrive, and then information about, um, uh, you know, r real-time uh, statistics on 
expectations on earnings or fundamental data. That was uh, until recently. Now the kind of data that you can extract is very different, right? You can uh, uh, obtain satellite images of super tankers as they cross the ocean. And it is not a matter of prediction anymore. You know that there's going to be a shortage of crude in New York Harbor. Uh, you can uh, install sensors to measure um, uh, atmospheric pressure, uh, humidity in, in certain areas where you try to estimate the yield of a crop. You can put uh, short circuit cameras at tunnels to measure density going through Lincoln Tunnel in Manhattan. You can uh, take photos of multiple uh, parking lots uh, outside uh, wholesalers. Uh, you can take night photographs, satellite night photographs of hundreds of thousands of municipalities in the U.S. to try to determine whether there is an increase in economic activity and therefore whether there is a probability that perhaps these municipal bonds are going to be upgraded or downgraded. This is the kind of information that is available now that was not available a few years ago. And this is truly significant in the sense that at some point when you have enough amount of data, it's no longer a prediction. You're just counting beans, right? Uh, a prediction involves making some assumptions, having a theory, and it's a kind of a leap of faith, right? Uh, that's the way an economist thinks. I'm going to predict GDP. And of course, he's not, he's not able to track the economic output of every single individual. That's, forecasting is the job of, econo of an economist. What, when you have the amount of data that we have for the first time in history today, at some point in time, we are not going to make predictions. We're just going to estimate outputs, and it's not going to be a prediction based on some um, theories or, or beliefs. It, you're just going to count and measure very accurately what could be the earnings of this particular company. And you may know the earnings of this company before the executives of that company. So, that's why, where I think that um, <clears throat> the kind of alternative data that is beginning to be available today is going to make a big change in finance, a change that we have never seen before because this, data, this kind of data was never available until now. If I could yes. add something to that that also relates to the previous question. There's a key distinction in financial data between what you get when you're doing it and what you see when you're doing research in it. It's the difference between as reported, real time, with all the errors, with all the delays that uh, systems are prone to, versus the cleaned up time sequenced version that you pull down for a research data set. Um, arguably, the flash crash was caused by errors. The, the people still argue about in, in timing. But the, it's, it's not idealized. So if you really want to do it right, you have to record your own data uh, and timestamp it yourself as it comes in to see how your trading strategy or investment strategy would do. So this is much more important on, on, on the, the, the faster you go. If you're looking at daily data, that doesn't really mess up too much, though, though sometimes it's corrected. Uh, but if you're looking at, at ticks, um, what, what, you, what you see in the historical uh, databases is not what you get in, in your trading system. I have a question to Alejandro. Um, you said that uh, heuristics lead us to suboptimal solutions. Mm -hmm. Unqualified. Mm -hmm. Sorry, say that again. Uh, you said heuristics lead uh, to suboptimal solutions. They could, then, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you been at my talk? If I can. <laughs> Have you been at my talk? <laughs> no, yeah, no. okay. <laughs> so it depends, but I think, uh, so, so the type of uh, problems, I mean, I certainly, if you tell me that, for example, that you can solve uh, NP-hard problems in polynomial time, with that actually, uh, then I certainly, that's the, type of, that is, that's the type of problems that we're interested in. So, of course, I mean, you can exploit the structure, and it's great, actually. We use heuristics as well in quantum computation. Right. But the idea is that there are problems that are known, or at least, for example, unless MP is equal to P, yeah. that we know finding those heuristics are not going to work in, in this yeah. type of problem. Uh, let me make my point. Now, 
Uh, you also talked about portfolio optimization. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that you're using the usual rhetoric about optimization that only holds in the past, you can optimize you know, something that you know already, but you have no way to find the optimal portfolio for the future. So this is just rhetoric. Hmm? And also the term that heuristics would find suboptimal solutions is equally rhetoric because there is no optimal solution to be known. You can show that something is better than something else, but this is the typical rhetoric of economics. And I warn you, using this rhetoric, I know you're a business person and that's useful, but consider, I would like to see that you test your own models, including the future quantum computation models, in prediction, because the problem is not computation. Intractability, fine, that's a different problem. The problem is estimation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would love to see whether these models can resolve the bias variance dilemma that's well known in machine learning that has to do with prediction and not with computation. Yeah, certainly, I mean, the, this, this type of problems are the, the ones that certainly we would like to actually to see, the problems that certainly you're struggling with. Uh, the point of the heuristics, as I said, maybe it was too broad of a comment. Uh, it should have been emphasized only to this uh, particular in intractability uh, class of family. So that's how we, we, I mean, we the only way to get by is with heuristics. And, uh, and certainly, I mean, it, it, that's the case where if we knew if we can exploit the structure, that's great. And actually, that's why it's so hard to compete with the classical pipeline. It's because there are decades of research of many people like you that actually exploiting those, 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 those details, those fine details. So I agree with you. Certainly, that's precisely, I mean, the last comment that you made, actually, is that's what we are going after. Like, really, applications where we, we can show, or that actually, or you can tell me, I, I can certainly crack this down. So that's precisely the type of application that we're after, like the, the most intractable ones. I, I, I wanted to defend Alejandro and <laughs> as follows. I think this is a very typical case when two different communities talk because words have different meanings. Yeah. What Alejandro means and what I would mean when I say heuristic algorithm, it's an algorithm in the computer science sense. In computer science, you have problems that are NP hard, which means that you cannot actually come up with an efficient algorithm to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. So all you can try is uh, algorithms that are heuristic, that try out good solutions. And so this is a different way of using heuristic than I think you're using it in terms of a problem. Yeah. Let, let me, let me uh, bring a, a study that was published by De Miguel and other people, I believe in the year 2007 in the Review of Financial Studies. And essentially they analyzed the performance out of sample of 20 very well-known convex optimization algorithms applied to uh, portfolio optimization. And to your point, one, th their main conclusion was that the 20 best known portfolio optimization uh, algorithms, one of them was Markovich, but you know, there were uh, uh, you know, a, a wide variety of them. Uh, all of them out underperform, out of sample, the one over M portfolio, right? But let me tell you, the, the, the algorithm didn't fail. The algorithm did what it was supposed to do. The, it was a, an in-sample portfolio optimization, and they were successful in the sense that they computed the portfolio that was optimal in-sample. The, the goal of the, of the problem was not to produce a portfolio that, was, that should be optimal out of sample, right? Um, that's, that's just not the problem. <laughs> I, I know, it's, it does, that's, but that's the way portfolio optimization works, right? We are trying to optimize a portfolio based on uh, some covariance matrix that uh, very typically has uh, poor mathematical properties in finance, right? Now, let me tell you at the same time, so that's, that's to your point. I, I, uh, I, I agree with you that very often we identify mathematical solutions that happen to be optimal in sample, but then they are not optimal out of sample because that was not the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise was to compute a, a solution that was optimal in sample. At the same time, it is true that there are complex techniques today that, that can outperform both convex optimization and uh, the one over and the naive portfolio. Some of them use heuristics as well. Um, it's still their machine learning algorithm because machine learning happens to use heavily on, on heuristics. So I, I think what you're saying has 
has some truth on it, uh, meaning that heuristics is an integral part of machine learning. And machine learning uh, has this ability of combining heuristics with, um, with robust mathematics in order to achieve uh, solutions that happen to be better out of sample. Right? Yeah, let me just add actually a, an important point because, and, and this, is very, it, this is very important because I don't want to give the impression actually that what I'm saying is that with quantum computers you can solve these intractable problems uh, in, that scale exponentially in polynomial time. I'm not saying that by any means. Right. Actually, it's, it's quite the opposite. I mean, we're even struggling to see if we can, that's what I call the word advantage. And as you mentioned, I think we're in the same page. I mean, I think uh, it's really harming I mean, when you have these problems of prediction of the future. You just don't know even, I mean, how to even characterize what's global and what is actually optimal. And in that case is what I see that quantum computer, even in the near term, is another heuristic in the summer. It uses an approximation, and it just might give you a different solution. Whether that solution actually could be valuable or not, that's precisely what we want to identify. So it's just, I mean, there is plenty of room. I mean, the intractability is something that I'm not, I'm not even claiming that we can solve. I mean, I'm, I'm actually more like on the, the accepted side that we can solve these problems in polynomial time. I mean, otherwise we'll be breaking most likely some laws of physics. But in principle, is there is plenty of room for improvement from actually from what we know. And that's, that's what I see a potential. It's just to get a different solution from what you use and any other researcher use. It's just to come up with different solutions that could be valuable and maybe hopefully have a, a better I and mean, a lower cost. And actually, and that's, that's basically the, the, the point that I was trying to make. Thank you. When it comes to finance and to um, generating alpha and trading and picking stocks, why is it this is not a zero sum game? And if it is a zero sum game, is it a good idea to invest a lot of money? Into, very, into an arms race for a zero-sum game? Well, is, is it a zero-sum game? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, if you go into an, if you went into the Google IPO and, at the beginning and stayed there, you made a lot of money. Who lost? I don't, I, I don't see the loser. Um, I, you know, there are situations like that. I think there are other investing uh, disciplines um, where it, you know, like maybe options trading, you know, for every buyer, you know, there's somebody on the other side, so if you made money, somebody no, didn't. So, so it's, not, it's not always. What uh, is distributed via dividends or capital appreciation is what the economy produces in different parts of a capital structure. This doesn't change. So, you are very smart, you will appropriate a better part of this production of the economy. But someone else will get less. But that person will get another algorithm. Well, I mean, if you count opportunity cost, I mean, you know, if, I mean, there's only so much Google stock in, in 1990, when did they go, what was the IPO, 95, 96? You know, there's only so much. And if I bought some of it, that meant Somebody else couldn't buy it. So if you count that, if you count the opportunity cost, yeah, then it is a zero-sum game. Yeah. But uh, not in not in the strict sense that I, I would. I think options trading would have to be a zero-sum game. Yeah. But from a society's point of view, um, it seems to be a zero-sum game. Um, actively trading. I mean, you could say index funds are a zero-sum. I mean, if you once you once you throw opportunity cost into it. You know, even if you're not picking any stocks, you're just, you know, you're just buying index funds. Uh, the people, you know, the, the market in general has gone up historically. And, you know, that's, that, once your investment portfolio gets very big, you pretty much, that's all you have, that's all you really can do. You know, if you've got, you know, you know a trillion, you know, 500 billion, a trillion to invest, if you're like ADP, I think that, the Dutch National Pension Fund is the world's largest pension fund. They, they can't really, they can pick little IPOs, but you know, the, even if they do great, it comes out in the six decimal place because they're so large, because they have to make small investments. So that's, you know, I, I, I didn't think of that as a, you know, a zero sum game. It's more or less a, you know, a rising tide lifting all boats. There's one here from the audience, Alejandro. Uh, Bitcoins, on, Bitcoins on quantum computers? Yes, definitely. So, the, uh, so let's say also it's related to the, to the previous comment is there are certain applications we know quantum computers will, will excel. If we had actually a fully error-corrected quantum device, for example, like factoring, I mentioned a couple of those, searching a structure uh, and a structure, doing 
searches on an structured databases. Mm -hmm. That's another one that will get you a quadratic speed up. The ones that are kind of like more like in the blurry uh, domain is precisely those ones where we say that actually quantum computers are used just as approximate, approximating solution heuristics like MP hard problems. Those were are unclear. In bitcoins, I get it will depend really on the nature of the problem. So the way we see it is, is it a counting problem? Basically, I mean, you just need to exhaustively go over all of them. So then the answer maybe, I mean, the, the, what you can get is at most maybe, a, is, this a, is it a search problem? Then most likely you will get a quadratic speed up. But it really depends, as I said. Uh, what you have to watch out is, is how, 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 how long are you, are you willing to wait? Because, I mean, all these applications, like in a structured search factoring, they rely on fault tolerant quantum computers, and that's something that we see more like in the long term, maybe 20, 30 years ahead. Uh, the type of approaches, the type of interesting problems, and that's maybe to be discussed, if there, is, there are any interesting problems that can be in Bitcoins that can be phrased like that, like the optimization problems, combinatorial optimization, or maybe if people are using machine learning for Bitcoin, uh, for Bitcoin mining or something, that would be an, an interesting intersection because then there is room for improvement. There. But I would say it really depends on the nature of the problem. Very good. I have a, a short follow-on question. How much energy does it take to produce bitcoins? I mean, I, I mean there's like... Yeah, so I, well, I, really I, hope, I really hope we don't... We, that's, I, not I, the, that's not the value. Uh, well, I really hope we find other, uh, other more interesting well, applications. On, on quantum, <laughs> on quantum, quantum, quantum I can Netflix. Actually, I can answer <laughs> this, and it still is uh, basically uh, consuming less energy than the money you can make. So in other words, at a point when you consume as much electricity, as the sort of value that you're generating through right. Bitcoin mining, people will stop doing Bitcoin mining. Right, and right now it's about half, so. Getting there. <laughs> it's getting away. there. <laughs> All right, <laughs> we have run out of time. Thank you to our panelists, Paul Simon, come to lunch. <laughs>